The U.S. President Donald Trump has given a wide-ranging State of the Union address calling on Americans to unite and on politicians to start working together across party lines. On foreign policy, he announced a new summit in three weeks' time with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. His speech was due to be delivered last month, but was delayed because of the dispute over government funding for his controversial border wall. Madam Speaker, the President of the United States. Arriving for his second annual address at the High Temple of American Politics. For a State of the Union that's a week behind schedule. Such is the roller coaster of Donald Trump's presidency. On the agenda in this sprawling speech, economic boom, border walls, and matters of war and peace. If I had not been elected President of the United States, we would right now, in my opinion, be in a major war with North Korea. My relationship with Kim Jong-un is a good one. Chairman Kim and I will meet again on February 27th and 28th in Vietnam. That news will surely dominate the headlines, but Trump soon turned to the issue which almost saw this showdown in Congress called off, his controversial plans to build a wall on the Mexico border. In the past, most of the people in this room voted for a wall, but the proper wall never got built. I will get it built. In their official response, the Democrats called Trump's decision to shut down the government over the wall a disgrace. Good evening, American, and happy Lunar New Year. I'm Stacey Abram. The shutdown was a stunt engineered by the President of the United States one that defied every tenet of fairness and abandoned not just our people, but our values. Facing a divided Congress for the first time, the president called for compromise and cooperation before attacking an FBI investigation into his campaign links to Russia. Amid the divisions, there were flashes of unity as Donald Trump looked out on a pool of Democratic female congresswomen dressed in the white of the suffragette movement. Don't sit yet, you're gonna like this. <laughs> and exactly one century after Congress passed the constitutional amendment giving women the right to vote, we also have more women serving in Congress than at any time before. Harmony at last, but in this deeply polarised cauldron of politics, for how long? Let's get a deeper analysis now of this speech. We are joined here in the studio by Tori Tausig. She's with the Brookings Institute, a Washington nonpartisan think tank. She is a specialist on U.S. foreign policy. Welcome to the program. Um, you know, th this president, he, he built this speech as one that would unify the country. Of course, we have, um, you know, divisive politics as uh, uh, recently, um, especially given the government shutdown in Washington. How did you see it? Well, let's remember, State of the Union addresses are meant to do two things. One, to bring unity to a country, and second, to outline the primary policy proposals put forward by the president. However, we have to remember the context that this speech was given in. This is at the end of a unprecedented 35-day-long government shutdown, and it was given by an incredibly divisive president who is constantly calling out Democrats for being a disservice to the country and who just hours before the speech uh, berated uh, Democratic Senator Chuck Schumer for uh, it's kind of taunting him for losing the uh, se Senate majority, so to speak, in the Senate. And so this was a speech given by a divisive president during a divisive time, and there was not much he could say to overcome that context. And given that, I mean, what did you make of the dynamics in the room, especially? I mean, one, one couldn't help but notice that the women there were making quite a strong statement. Yeah, of course. All of the women were clad in suffragette white to show that this was the most uh, female-heavy Congress ever in American history. 
Of course, uh, traditionally, we can always look at the body language of those in the room to assess how positive uh, what the president is saying is received. There was a lot of negative body language from Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi. A few moments of standing when President Trump uh, spoke out for typically uh, united, united policies. However, the body language was relatively tense in the room. What did you make of the content of the speech? I mean, Trump, in a way, this was really um, his greatest hits. I think we have to say he, he, he called for border wall funding. Um, he also hailed the successes of his international diplomacy, as he called it, with North Korea. We also got some more details about um, his upcoming meeting with Kim Jong-un that we know will take place now in February. Your reaction to the focus of this speech, to the content? So, of course, President Trump was going to come out and speak about the economic strengths that we're seeing in the United States, 4% unemployment, high economic growth. All of these are accurate, and, and the president rightfully uh, tried to strike a positive note on that. Uh, of course, he then went after more controversial policies like border funding, which overshadowed a lot of the speech, and then turned to a number of foreign policies, uh, including this upcoming summit with Kim Jong-un. I think the national security community in Washington and abroad has always been very skeptical of President Trump's attempts at diplomacy with Kim Jong-un. And I think that skepticism will continue moving into this next planned summit. If you are an international ally of the United States, how do you think that you view this speech? Because, I mean, this is a president who has very much been known for cozying up to enemies, um, alienating those allies. What do you think their takeaways would have been? I think if we look at NATO allies, for example, they were not expecting much from this speech. President Trump, like presidents prior, have called out NATO allies for not spending enough on defense, but he has struck a particularly harsh tone, almost questioning the intrinsic value of the alliance itself. And so there was not much that alliances, uh, that NATO allies were looking for in this speech. Of course, in the Middle East, we've had a recent announcement from President Trump saying that the U.S. will withdraw troops from Syria. Regardless of how allies in the region viewed this, it was met negatively by his own Senate Republican members. And so I think he feels embattled both uh, within Washington and abroad when it comes to a number of his recent foreign policy statements. Tori Tausig, breaking it all down for us um, on this State of the Union address by the U.S. President Donald Trump. Thanks, Tori. Thank you.